You are listening to Parenting Our Future with certified parent coach, Robin McMahon, author of The Yelling Cure and founder of Parenting for Connection. My podcast is all about providing you with the tools and solutions you need in your parenting so you can create the family you always wanted. For more information on my book and other resources, check out yellingcurebook.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Parenting Our Future. I'm Robin McMahon, and I have a guest that everybody listening needs to hear from. Oh my goodness, Cindy Utzinger. She is a licensed occupational therapist who specializes in pediatrics and sensory integration with over 20 years of experience. Now, the reason you really want to hear what Cindy has to say is because she wrote a book that you have all, uh, with a sentence, with a title that is a sentence you've all said, which is, why is my kid doing that? Which is a sensory approach to understanding your child's behavior. Oh my goodness. Cindy, where have you been all my life? <laughs> all of my mom <laughs> life. Um, but I just want to tell more about how amazing you are. So during your career, you have developed outpatient pediatric programs, working both one-on-one with groups of children and their parents. You also enjoy spending time in schools, sharing classroom strategies with teachers to create an environment to enhance learning. Yes, so important. And your passions are teaching, keynote speaking at schools and parenting events, empowering parents with tools to both understand their children um, and to help them succeed. And then you have a blog at cindyatzinger.com, which we will share uh, and share some more because I think it's really important. Thank you for being here so much. Thank you. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yay! I am beyond excited, as you can tell, because look, I think that there are a lot of cases where kids have some sensory issues and parents are just like, I don't know what's going on. And we can relate it to sensory issues, but then what? What do we do? What if it's not? Um, you know, what if it isn't a dramatic sensory issue or a big one, then what do you do? It's just something where there isn't a diagnosis, but it's enough where it can interfere with behavior and interfere with cooperation, right? Then what do Mm -hmm. you do? And, you know, I like to tell parents too, we, every kid, I compare it to a kink in a hose. Uh, I say we all, if you, if you kink a hose, right, we know the water just isn't going to run out as fast. So, especially when kids, when parents bring their kids to me, because we don't want their kids to feel um, too unique. We don't want them to feel that they're different or that there's a weakness. So I just explained, there's just a kink in your hose and we want to straighten that hose out so the water can just rush through. But I also explained that we all have, we all have a kink in our hose. We all have sensory things. Um, so, but when we understand that, we're just much more able to work through it, to self-regulate, you know, that, that self-awareness is, mm-hmm. is the key. And I, I, I do like to explain to parents too, and I feel like it's good to just throw in, in here is, um, if parents start wondering, every kid has their things. We all, we all know that. And and the purpose of my book is so that parents can understand what they can do on an everyday basis to help empower their kids through their things. What leads children to me for occupational therapy is when their things are interfering with their daily life. Yes. That's when we have like, okay, let's, let's seek some help. Let's get some help for this. But I think a lot for a lot of kids, it doesn't interfere drastically with their daily life. So it's just about what can I do on an everyday basis to just build a strong foundation in my child. Yeah, I think that's really great. And and I think the reality too is that awareness equals empathy, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of being frustrated, which, you know, can lead to anger and then our kids feeling like there is something wrong with them when they can't help it, then as parents we can say, "Okay, hold on a second. Like this is this is something that my child isn't choosing, isn't trying to upset me. It's just a kink in his hose and Mm -hmm. I can help him and I can see him as needing help instead of him being a problem or that Mm -hmm. behavior being a problem. So I really like that. Um, Now, 
you know, we really, um, what I want to talk to you about, there's, there's really four areas that we, we can talk about right now and really is just looking at your kids' behaviors through a sensory lens and looking at the why behind that. So how do you do that? How, how do you understand why your kid is doing what they're doing if you're looking through a sensory lens? Right. So we have to kind of understand the sensory, the sensory system. And just to give a little background too. So I like to describe um, development as a triangle or as a pyramid. So we've got our pyramid and we've got our triangle. And the very base of that is our DNA. That's foundational. Um, you know, certainly there's work that we certain doctors can do to help to, if, if DNA needs help, but, um, but, anyway, but that's foundational, the, the DNA. And then the next layer of our foundation is, um, is our reflex maturation. And that's a whole kind of another, another talk for another day. But I always like to throw out the reflex system. It's just important that those involuntary infant reflexes become truly voluntary movements. And, and the best thing parents can know for that is tummy time. So if anybody listening has an infant, tummy time is super important. That's the best way that children can start to integrate those reflexes. But the next layer of our foundation is the sensory system. So those are, those are the foundational things. And I've heard people describe it as an iceberg, right? Those are the things mm -hmm. below the water that you don't see. The things above the water, the iceberg above, the part above that we see are the top part of their sensory triangle or pyramid are their emotional and behavioral regulation, skill development, uh, even academic skills all fall or all the things that we see. So we see problems in those areas. We see what's at the top, but we have to say, where is that coming from? Yeah. What is beneath the surface? And again, a lot of times it's coming from the sensory system. So then, Tanya, then you have to have a little bit of knowledge of the sensory system. And, and the important thing there is that we all understand sight, smell, touch, uh, sound. Those are the, the senses we, we think about. But there's two other senses that we don't really know about or don't pay as much attention to. And those are um, just, I'll throw the words out there real quick, but it's proprioception and vestibular senses. But those two senses help us to understand how our body is moving and how, what our body is doing in space. And it's so important that kids have that really good foundational understanding of what their body is capable of doing, how it's moving in space, how it's interacting with the world around them. You know, it gives them spatial awareness, body awareness. It help, gives them sense of direction that I know I hear this and it's over here and my body's right here so I can understand where that's coming from. Or just even to have that confidence with what their body is capable of doing to help them want to jump on that bike and try riding the bike or try something that uh, a, a new something that's going to challenge their body in a different way that they haven't used their body before. Um, but I, I think a lot of fears and anxieties can come back to that as well. Because if I don't have a really good, solid, firm foundation of myself and my body and what I'm capable of doing and how my body interacts with the world around me, then that's kind of that's kind of scary, you know, that's, that's going to lead to, to some fears, um, or, and, and, you know, maybe avoiding certain things. Um, and then, and I'm probably rambling, I'm probably giving you more than you want to know. <laughs> Just, I'm giving you a really long answer to your question. Oh, it's but, good. <clears throat> I have questions kids, though. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so yeah, stop at any time. But even kids who want to move a lot, um, Again, they're seeking out that sensory input. So just to throw something else in here real quick. Um, so I like to compare the sensory system to coffee cups. And this is a real simplified um, 
explanation of the sensory system. It's good. But if you're a coffee like drinker, <laughs> yeah, if you're a coffee drinker, you'll get this, right? <laughs> As we know, happen to be, and most of the people listening, I bet, are too. Yes. Right, right. I take a sip of my coffee while you explain. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so you know how you are in the morning before you've had your cup of coffee. You're just not really focused. You're not at that, what we call your optimum level of arousal. So you're you know, if you sat down at your computer, had a bunch of emails to answer, trying to do your work, kids, you know, all over you, you're just, you're not there yet. You haven't had enough to fill your cup. So that can be, that is like children who, or, or some children are like that, where they just, they, they haven't had their coffee. They haven't had enough coffee yet. So they're, they're just under aroused. And then what happens with kids like that is, we can see them look real sluggish or lack, lack energy. You know, I, I know homeschooling my son right now, I saw that in the morning with him where he needed to get up and exercise before he did his schoolwork. He just wasn't stimulated and aroused enough to do his schoolwork. But then what we see on the other hand is some kids need so much coffee and what they do is they seek it out. So they're touching, they're moving, they're hanging from the rafters, they're doing everything they can do to try to fill their coffee cup because they realize they haven't had enough sensory stimulation yet. So they're seeking it, they're seeking it out. So we'll see those sensory seeking behaviors. Then we have kids, you know, I don't know, I know I can be sensitive to coffee some days. Some days I can drink a whole pot, some days I drink just a little bit and it was too much. So we have kids like that too, where they're just a little bit of coffee, a little bit of sensory stimulation, and it's too much for them. So they're, they're overstimulated. They're, and, and we know when we're overstimulated, we're not at that optimum level of arousal either, that just right place to be able to focus. So those kids, then we'll see behaviors out of those children because they're overstimulated, they're shutting, they're shutting down. They need, we need to, we need to rein them back in and help them with some strategies to, to calm back down from, from all of that. Okay. That was awesome information. Holy cow. I am, I'm going to um, just sort of recap what you said, because I want to make sure that I understand it and that everybody else understand it. So basically what you're saying is among all of the other senses that we have, there's also these underlying senses, which um, are really about what your, uh, how your body feels um, and moves in its, in your body and how you sort of feel in the space of like the, the, the place that you're in the room that you're in or, or whatever. And, and those are those two, senses the vestibular and the proprioception something like that right yes yes <laughs> close just, enough close enough, close enough. Yeah, okay. so you can say it the right way what, 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 what is the right it's it's proprioception <clears throat> yeah. I had one less class I think uh, syllable in there anyway sorry about uh, that. proprioception yeah. But what that means, and I've never heard those two words before, I never knew that, that that was a thing. So thank you for that. Um, but really what that does is it can show itself because this is like the bottom of the iceberg, but above the surface, we are going to see kids behavior that shows us that they're sluggish or shows us like that they're seeking um, they're seeking stimulus everywhere, which is like the coffee example, right? Um, or they're overstimulated, right? Um, what's the difference between seeking it everywhere and, and overstimulation? Where's the line there? So seeking it is those kids, and if you have a sensory seeker, you, you, you'll get this. Um, so, so seeking, those kids who are seeking it are just constantly on the go. They are those kids who are easy to confuse as ADHD. So how to touch everything. They, um, you know, might be, I mean, they might even kind of act out and be hitting siblings. They just can't be still. They are those kids that you can say, sit still, sit still a million times, and they just can't. Um, so, so yeah, so those kids who are seeking, they just, those, you, stop touching, stop moving, stop this, stop that. You know, you, those, those are the seekers. 
Um, overstimulation is when you start to see more of that shutdown. Mm. Um, they, and, and your kids can act different when overstimulated. I know for me personally, when I'm overstimulated, I will start to yell. I mean, I, I can start to yell and, and act out towards my children. Um, you know, I know, I, I know what's going on. So I keep it inside. I keep it. I'm like, okay, I know I'm auditory. I'm overstimulated. But then all of a sudden I'm like, ah, you know, and, and I crack. So you can see those kids, they might want to avoid a situation because they might avoid movie theaters. They might hate the vacuum cleaner. They might hate touch their hands getting dirty. Um, they just know they're going to avoid it because they know what's too much. But then once they've had too much, we might see meltdowns, tantrums, yeah. things like that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I guess that really leads us to the question, what do we do? What do we do when this is going on? So, you know, first, I think it is important and there, I have one in my book and I have one on my website and, and there are other places on the internet too, but you can um, look at a sensory checklist. And I think that that is really helpful because the sensory checklist breaks it down into each one of the senses and whether they um, are overly sensitive or under sensitive to it, whether there's somebody whose coffee cup gets too foot filled or, or doesn't have enough. And I should stop here too and say, it's not a cut and dry type of thing. And it can vary in one child from minute to minute, from day to day, you know, being tired, being hungry, um, being stressed out. You know, our, our kids carry a lot of stress that we don't, I don't think we even you know, think about. So, so it can vary. So it's not like you have a child who is, this has this kind of copy cover, or, you know, is this, and you can just, just label them with one nice, clear, well, I mean, and, and I think that goes for everybody, right? I mean, we are different moment to moment, right? And you add in hunger, you add in tiredness, you add in stress, you add in all sorts of different things, new experiences, and that just throws, can amplify it or just throw it completely off, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, but I think when you do the checklist, you, it kind of opens your eyes. And, and I always tell people too, you might do the checklist and be like, you know, there's not one thing on here or there's very few things that I identify as describing my child. So then, you know, if, if you don't see much there, then maybe what's going on with your child isn't as much sensory. Maybe there is something a little different going on there. Um, but if you identify quite a few things on that checklist, then you're like, okay, there's some sensory stuff going on with my child. So, so the then what is, so again, then when you understand, so maybe it's, um, maybe you see a lot under the vestibular system. And just to give a real quick thing about the vestibular system, we get vestibular input. Our vestibular system or receptors are in our inner ear. So as we move our heads through space, we get vestibular input. So great ways to get vestibular input are through swinging, rolling, spinning, jumping, being upside down, all of those great things. So when we see, okay, so my child, um, gosh, they're kind of craving vestibular input. Let's say, you know what? So what I wanna do is I wanna create a lifestyle where they get lots of good sensory input. Mm -hmm. um, they get lots of that good vestibular input. I wanna make sure swinging, going to the park is part of our everyday experience. Um, again, or you might, you know, you might see that, oh, my child gets, is overly sensitive to this vestibular input. Mm -hmm. and, and then again, and I, I talk a lot about this in the book, so I, I it's, there's a lot I could say on this. Mm -hmm. um, so, but there are great activities that you can do. Hugely helpful. Yeah, I love to, that. To, to, help, to help with those things. But, but again, the first thing is to help identify where is your child? Where, where, where are your child's sensory things? Okay, so, and you have a checklist on your site, which uh, is Cindy at singer.com and that I will put a link to your um, to your checklist because that is so important. Of course, that makes perfect sense. You start there. And then if it doesn't if, if you don't you know make the list, then look, you, you've got to look at a different a different uh, issue. 
know that you know my big my, this is my my mission in life i guess is um is helping parents to understand the importance of a sensory lifestyle and it's for every child whether your child is a child who um they're, they're oversensitive or undersensitive. You know, whether you have a child who gets overstimulated or you have a child who needs more, um, believe it or not, the child who's understimulated needs a sensory lifestyle as well. Because again, we're trying to build that good, strong sensory foundation for them. So it's just so important that our children get a really, um, just a, a lifestyle where they get lots of great sensory input. And we used to call it back in the day, we used to call it a sensory diet. And we've changed that language now, right? We know sensory, you know, diets don't work anymore. So it's about right. a lifestyle. So it's so important for parents to understand um, just that, that a, a day filled with opportunities to move and swing and be upside down and get your hands dirty and just explore are so important. And again, and when you understand what your child's kinks are, what their things are, then you can help really fill their day um, in a way that is really gonna be beneficial to them. And, and I'll give you just a few examples. My daughter is a sensory, she's a bit of a sensory seeker. And she reads um, hanging upside down from her gymnastics bar. Oh. Or I have a spin board. It's basically a big board on a lazy Susan. And so she will spin as she, as she reads. So, you know, you're, you're like, are you really focusing? Are you, are you learning anything right now? And she can tell you, but if I were to make her sit at a desk and be still, she would not be learning and retaining half as much as she does when she's spinning herself to death. <laughs> Well, there, there is that concept comment. where you have to be in motion to be still, right? Right. And yes. Which she's, that's what you've just described, right? Yes. And we have to honor that in our kids. And for those kids that are struggling and it looks like behavior, uh, I think what parents uh, are worried about is they're worried about giving in to them and that somehow that's giving them permission to do the things that they do. Like, let's say they don't want to sit at the dinner table or it's hard for them to sit at the dinner table. Um, mm -hmm. And you offer maybe the idea of like a wiggle stool or a wiggle chair um, or maybe some, um, some fidget uh, sort of like fidget spinner or fidget, you know, um, little toy. Um, but they're worried about doing that, worried that that's going to uh, enable the behavior. What do you say about that? So a couple things. Uh, that's a great question. So I think we have to, number one, understand that our kids, they're, neurolo they're neurologically developing, right? So we have to kind of honor that. And, and I think it's important that we understand, first of all, that our kids aren't mini adults, right? They're, they're kids and we have to treat them like kids. But I again, the more that we give them opportunities through accommodating their needs, we're building that sensory foundation. And when we build that good, strong foundation, then the stuff that we see, again, the emotions, behavior, skills, are going to be solid themselves. So when we, when we make those accommodations for them now, we are setting them up for success in the future. And they won't always need that. They're not always gonna need a fidget. What we're doing is we're helping them right now. We're meeting them where they are neurologically and developmentally. And we're making them feel, because again, I mean, me saying sit still, sit still, sit still, and them not being able to do that, that's just gonna be a confidence drainer, right? So then they're gonna think I'm a bad kid. I can never do what they need me to do. But if I say, you know what, I see that you can't sit still at the dinner table. So you know what, you can either stand at the dinner table or you can sit on an exercise ball. But you have to be at the dinner table, right? I'm all about boundaries. Well, now they're successful. Now they're set up for success. Now I haven't had to yell 400 times at the dinner table. And, and it's a win-win. So Cindy, and, you are speaking my language. <laughs> this is what I try to teach the parents that I work with all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, look at what you've done. And I also like parents to embrace temporary, like it's not going to last mm -hmm. forever. 
but mm -hmm. you're so bang on. They're neurologically developing. They are not little human, like little adults. Um, they are little humans. We can honor them. We can respect their needs and help them and um, giving them, um, yeah, honoring them and respecting that they have needs that are different than ours too mm -hmm. is important. So I really love that. I think it helps too, you know, when we give language. So, you know, hey, sweetie, I see that you have a really hard time sitting still. What can we do to help with that? Would you like to get up, do some jumping jacks? Do you need to sit on a ball? Like, what can you do? Because I think it's all about bringing self awareness so that they can learn self regulation, right? So, when we can use language with them and help them gain a self-awareness. Because again, even as adults, we have our own things. I can't sit at a desk and focus for 30 minutes without fidgeting with something or getting up to you know, use the restroom or get a sip of water or something. So we have our own things too. We just are free to, we're, we're free to regulate. You know, we're free to use our strategies that work for us. And a lot of times our kids kind of know what they need sometimes. It's a little bit out, you know, out of the ordinary to us or, or seems, socially acceptable. <laughs> right, right. So, so we, yeah, so we don't want them to do that. But if the more that we can bring that self-awareness to them. So, okay, I see you have a hard time with this. What are some ways that we can make you more successful at this, then they're gonna to learn to self-regulate. And I think that in and of itself is the most important thing we can help them to do is to learn what their thing is. So as they get older, they can um, just work with their own strengths and uniquenesses, turn or strengths and weaknesses, turn their weaknesses into strengths and just honor their uniqueness and, and how they can um, make the best of this. You're currently listening to Parenting Our Future. I'm parent coach Robin McMahon, and I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Did you know that by the age of six, many girls believe that they're less smart than boys? And only 19% of children's books showcase women with jobs or career ambition? As a parent, are you looking for stories to inspire your little girl to pursue her dreams without limits? Well, Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls podcast is an expansion of its best-selling book, which tells hundreds of bedtime stories about the lives of extraordinary women from the past and the present. Designed to close the confidence gap in young girls, these stories explore the talent and results of incredible women across every possible field from astronauts, chefs, trombonists, judges, scientists, and tennis players, from Jane Goodall to Simone Biles. So to inspire the rebel girl in your life, go and find good night stories for rebel girls on your favorite podcast player. Now back to the show. Thank you for all of that. We, uh, this has been really great. Uh, and the idea of a sensory lifestyle is something uh, that really is new to me. So I, I really, I really appreciate that. And I think our, our listeners will appreciate that as well. So um, what I want to ask you about is I have kind of a bunch of questions I want to rattle off at you. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, in the heat of the moment, mm -hmm. what can you do in the heat of the moment when you see your child is going to start unraveling? Like, do you have any specific tips mm -hmm. sure please help us you, my the easiest most wonderful tip are hugs you know we all hear right like hugs release that oxytocin that feel-good hormone but hugs are going back to my big word proprioception hugs are give deep pressure input which is what proprioception is so when we give that deep 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 hug not only are they feeling love and connected but we're giving them that deep pressure input it's the same thing with like a weighted blanket right that that's so comforting because of that deep pressure so hugs hands down the number one thing easy you can always give them a hug love um, next great tip is deep breathing and you know we hear about this, but um, it's so important because deep breathing. So a lot of our children actually, and heck, I find myself doing this too as I'm running about my day, going you know lightning speed. 
we can breathe with only the upper lobes of our lungs. So we're taking these deep, shallow breaths that are just, again, upper, upper lungs. And that actually activates the part of the nervous system that makes us, you know, start sweating and breathing heavily when we see blue lights in our rear view mirror or um, swat at a bug on our leg and, you know, it, um, or when you, when you feel a bug on your leg, you know, you're startled yeah, and you're yeah. getting sweating, breathing heavy. So we need children, heck, as adults, we need to be breathing deep belly breathing. So when we can work with our kids, and this sounds so silly, but kids, honestly, a lot of them don't know how to belly breathe. Mm -hmm. So we have to teach them that. So I love to just lay them down, wrap my, you know, put my hands around their belly and just say, you know, pretend you've got a balloon in your belly and just fill that balloon and, and then let the air go out of the balloon. And it's a good little exercise for, for your listeners to do. So you just put your hand on your belly and take some deep, slow breaths, really feel, filling your belly, letting it expand and contract. And then put your hand on your belly, but don't let your belly fill with air. Only breathe those shallow breaths through your upper lungs. And you will notice a difference in your level of, of alertness. So that belly breathing activates the part of our nervous system that helps us to calm. Mm -hmm. So there is, it's, there is a true neurological response yeah. to belly breathing. Yeah. So again, we can teach our kids that. And, and I, you know, I like to teach kids too, because I say, you know what, you can't, you can't always, there's a lot of strategies that you can't always put into place, but you can always breathe. So that's just a great strategy to always have in your pocket. Um, one of my other favorites is time in, and that's what I call it, but you can call it whatever you want. So as opposed to time out, so you're not punished, it is, this is your place to go and reconnect with yourself and pull yourself together. So it could be a beanbag chair. It could be a you know, sitting under a weighted blanket. It can be, I've had, you know, maybe a tent or a fort in the room. I had one kid who just sat on the bottom shelf of a bookshelf that was empty or sitting under a desk, wherever it is. It's just that it's important. It's important that the kid chooses it and it's their place. And nobody's really allowed to bother them there. And maybe they've got stuffed animals there, Legos, coloring stuff, you know, whatever it is, just something that is comforting to them. So helping them to identify where their happy place is, really, for lack of a better term. So, and then encouraging them, you know, so mommy sees that you're upset right now. Why don't you go to your time in spot? And then when you're ready, when you're done and you feel good again, then we can talk about it. And, you know, I had a mom recently who, oldest child, so easy, they could talk about emotions, this and that. The younger one, She's like, I want to talk about his emotions and help him feel, understand how he's feeling. And he just screams and runs away. And I think, you know, you've got to honor that child. He's, he doesn't want, he's not ready to talk about that right now. You know, he needs his space first. So I love, I think time in, it's always been so helpful um, in my family. Also, I'd like to use music. Mm. And I, what's important to understand is what's calming to you or I might not be what's calming to our children. So my daughter, what calms her is really, really, really loud music. Mm -hmm. um, drives me crazy because I have an auditory <laughs> sensitivity. I want soft spa-like spa music, yeah. but that's how it works for her. So it's helping your child find, because I think a lot of us really identify with music, right? And, but it's helping them to figure out what works, what works for them. Um, snacks or the foods, and I don't ever want to advocate stress eating, but when children are going to eat, think about not, and I'm not talking about a nutritional standpoint as much, but the, um, the, the, quali the um, how chewy or how crunchy their foods are, because you know, if you think about it, um, what do you go to eat when you're stressed out? Usually it's not applesauce, you know, usually it's Snickers bar or potato chips or pretzel, something chewy or crunchy. So when we can give our kids, um, again, not, hey, you're stressed out, let's eat a 
chewy bar, but um, but when they're when it's snack time or meal time, when we can give them those opportunities to um, just get those you know chewy granola bars, apple slices, um, carrots, sticks, dried bagels, dried fruit, anything like that. And the reason being, or drinking through a straw, sometimes even in the heat of the moment, it's like, you know what, take a drink. And I love to just have a water bottle or a cup that has a straw. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is that I talked about proprioception. And proprioception is neurologically organizing and calming. So that's why hugs, right? When we give that deep pressure, it's neurologically organizing and hugging. So when we allow them to use those proprioceptors in their jaw muscles, that's neurologically organizing and calming. So if you have a child who you allow to chew gum, gum is another great one. You know, my kids, I let them chew gum when they're doing their work at home because it's a great, um, it's just a great neurological organizer. So that's, that's a, um, another great tip to use. But, and also just exercise. Um, Again, as we talked about proprioception and vestibular input, it's movement input. Those are, uh, especially proprioception is neurologically organizing and calming, like I just said. And so we get proprioceptive input when we do heavy work or when we get deep pressure. So, and by heavy work, I'm not talking about having your child lift weights, just do some frog jumps, do some crab walks, do some wheelbarrow racing, um, run, you know, go, go take a quick break and just let's sprint up and down the block or something. Um, so again, when we, when we allow our children to exercise and get that heavy work, deep pressure kind of exercise input, that again is neurologically organizing and calming. And one last little tip, this isn't um, necessarily an OT tick, Tip, but uh, a, a play therapist that I work with taught me this and I was like this works like a charm so and I might say this wrong so forgive me but when kids are in meltdown mode they are in I want to say it's left brain mode I might I might have this totally up wrong they're 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 working in one side of their brain when they're having meltdown so what we want to do is we want to get them working in the other side of the brain to get them out of the meltdown. So the best way to do that is to have them start making a list. So works like a charm. Just give me your five, tell me five, um, list your five favorite friends or tell me five things you love to eat or your five favorite animals or something. Just have them start making a list and genius. Like a charm. I know. It's, I was like, but I told, asked this play therapist, I said, like, where have you been all my life? This is the best, this is the best tip I've ever, I've ever used. Uh, I would use it with my own children and with, and with tips and, and with children in the clinics. So, um, so yeah, again, think meltdown, have them start making lists. Wow. Okay. That's awesome. So <laughs> hugs, deep pressure hugs, uh, deep breathing, time in, happy place, right? Music, um, crunchy or chewy food and then like you just said making lists well that's just my dream so. <laughs> oh that's so cool that's so cool. I have a question about the breathing um, uh -huh. so in the moment of, of, of a meltdown or almost a, let's say your child is in a meltdown um, my understanding is that the 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 deep breathing the belly breathing in that um, in that moment can really get you back into control right mm -hmm. and uh and so we i've always been taught and and use the square breathing method right like mm -hmm. breathe in hold breathe out hold right so for four mm -hmm. seconds so that's also what you would use it sort of as a rescue remedy is that is that yes, correct? yes. and i i love i love that i find it can be hard with children um, I, I'm like, you know, I like to get them just to get the belly breathing down first, especially oh, yeah. for younger children. And then as they get the belly breathing down, then yes, I think that is amazing. And again, even that visual of the square or the box breathing is, yeah. is, um, is helpful too. But yeah, same. That's exactly the same idea.
Okay, that's great. So I want to now ask you about school. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. one of the things that you you reminded me of is I have a client and her her little boy is actually wants to sit under his desk to listen mm -hmm. to the lesson. Uh, and, and thankfully, he has a magical teacher that allows it. But, you know, there are going to be some things that happen in school that looks like maybe bad behavior, inattentiveness, um, you know, just frustrating, frustrating behavior. Um, so what can you say to parents, you know, who are struggling with the way their child is at school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that it's that's such a hard one. And, and again, school can be so tough because the kids just don't have much control of their day. They don't get to take breaks when they need to take breaks and go to the bathroom, eat when they're when they're hungry, when they need to use the bathroom. So there just isn't much control. And I think that that is is very hard for them. But again, and, and looking through, look through that sensory checklist. And when you can identify those areas, because I've seen a lot of kids who've really struggled in school um, because they have a tactile sensitivity. So it's that touch input, they're oversensitive because you are being touched constantly in school. At circle time, your knees are rubbing up against each other, standing in line, even at your desk. There's constantly the threat of being touch, touch, and that touch can feel so noxious and it can set off again that same fight, fright, or flight mode that when you see the blue lights in your rearview mirror or the spider crawling up your leg, touch can get us into that same mode. So if you identify that your child's kind of a tactile kid, then, you know, it, it's helpful to understand that, to see that that could be a really hard part of their school day. And then it's about talking to the teacher and making accommodations. Yeah, maybe they have a certain spot on the circle where nobody's close to them or they get to sit in their desk or, um, you know, they're, they're just sitting a little bit away from each other. Not so they seem, seem singled out but or appear to be singled out. But awesome. um, the other thing that is so hard in the school day is the auditory stimulation. And you know, if you think about it, especially if your child rides the bus to school, so the bus is probably the craziest, most overstimulating thing a child can do. So they get to school and they're already overstimulated. And now you've got maybe the bell ringing to tell you when to go to class. You've got uh, a lot of talking in the classroom. Um, and, and then they go to the cafeteria and the cafeteria is second uh, second only to the school bus, <laughs> the most really? exciting child, a thing a child can do. And so again, when is your child melting down in, in class? Is it right after lunch? Well, okay, they have, they have used everything in them to keep themselves under control, but the touch, the noises, they're done. They've got nothing, they've got nothing left to give. So again, I think identifying what your child's needs are. If your child is a child who needs a lot of that movement, then it's talking to the teacher about incorporating movement breaks or um, you know, some of the tricks I use are even, you know, you have to sit in your chair, but you can turn your chair different positions. So maybe the back of your chair is on the side or maybe the back of the chair is in the front of you. That allows you to use more core as you're sitting. And so, you know, instead of just slopping in your chair, you're not using your muscles. So it allows for more, there's just more inherent movement when your chair gets to be turned. Um, a silly little trick is just taking the sweatshirt and putting it, you know, Pete, you just take your sweatshirt off and you put yep. it over the back of your chair. Well, if you actually wrap it around the back of your chair and then tie it around your waist, oh. and it gives that deep pressure input. Oh. Uh, it's kind of like people, talk, you know, weighted blankets, people wear weighted vests. It gives them that weighted kind of feel. And again, nobody knows you're doing that. You know, they just, you know, it, it can look very, um, innocent. Um, Right? Yes. Um, also, you know, it's still in others, if your kid is a kid who needs movement breaks, maybe your child or maybe your teacher designates them to be the errand runner. You know, maybe these books need to be run to the library or this note needs to be run to the principal. Just work those movement breaks in. I'm a big advocate. I, I know not all schools allow this, but again, the water bottle with the straw, mm. just something you suck through. Um, on the desk, because even just that opportunity to stop and, and, you know, suck through that straw, use those proprioceptive, use those heavy work muscles in your jaw, 
you know, that's an easy, um, an easy way to get some, to get a good sensory break. Um, I saw this great, uh, I think more and more schools are allowing for the um, alternative seating. Mm. And I think that's great if your school allows for that. You know, they've got the hokey stools, which look like kind of like a mushroom stool, allow for a little bit of movement or beanbag chairs. Um, you know, again, it'll be interesting how, what, what all is allowed in schools again once once um, all of this this time is over but um, but if, if your child can have permission to sit in some type of alternative seating but I saw this great um, thing that a teacher had put on I think I saw it on Twitter but she had a little beanbag in a corner and she had a pretty little poster board that she wrote up and she had on it she said it said take three breaths count to ten and return to the class so that was her little time in spot that she had in the classroom. Let the kids go to your little time in, pull yourself together, do those things, and then you can come rejoin the class. And I thought that was a great idea. Again, teaching kids self-regulation um, and self-awareness even in the classroom. That's so great. And it's just normalizing it. Like we all have bad mm -hmm. days, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Whether we've got sensory issues or not. And so just permission to say, look, I'm going to go in the, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to take my deep breaths. I'm going to count to 10 and then I'll feel better. Like what a beautiful mm -hmm. message. And, and I think, you know, what I'm hearing from you is, you know, is a couple different things too, that one, you know, your child best. And you do need to advocate for your child in school, right? You know, you do need to work with the teachers and make sure that they're getting the help that they need. And, and one of the things that I know, um, you know, that some schools do in, in a punishing way is to take out something like recess. And I think that is damaging, right? That's what the kids need. They need, if, if they're seeking stimulation um, and they're moving around and then get told, well, you're moving around too much, so now you can't have recess, that is so counterproductive, right? Right. 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 And, and I, yes, I'm so glad you said that because, um, boy, if I could change one thing in this world, it would be that recess was never taken away from kids because again, that's, that's the only time the kids have to just go be kids and let it all out and re get their, get their sensory system back to that good, that good place, that just right level of arousal through running and jumping and moving and fresh air and being outside away from all the stimulation of the lights and the sounds of the classroom. And um, yeah, recess is just the most wonderful thing. Um, yes, that should never, never be taken away. And it really is advantageous to the teachers too never take it away. I saw a great dramatization one time. It was a kid in the classroom and he's rocking back and forth in a rocking chair. And he's saying, I'm focused, I'm focused, I'm focused. And the teacher says, sit still. And now he's like, no, I'm not focused anymore. And so again, I think when we understand that when kids are moving, they're showing us they need more movement. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. That's, that's so great. That's so great. And I find I do that. Like I tap my foot under my, un, mm -hmm. under my table and you know, I, you know, I do all sorts of stuff like that too. So I, we're all, we're all alike. Right. Uh, okay. I have some specific questions for you. So this is like my okay. lightning round, if you will. Okay. So um, what do you do if your child hates socks, has a problem with clothes in general, and doesn't like underwear touching them. Like I have heard it so many times. Socks are a big issue. Underwear is a big issue. Like it can only be this certain kind, or I've bought 15 different brands. None of them work in socks or underwear or whatever, and just clothes mm -hmm. and tags. Like, What is that all about? And how can we get our kids past that? Right. And that's, that's, that's a hard one. Um, that's, and it's a very common one. Um, and I do have a blog about this on my website. Um, so again, turn to the sensory checklist. My assumption in that case is there is a tactile oversensitivity. And so again, the, those things, it seems so weird to us, but they can feel noxious to them. Um, you know, I know for me, like my daughter will put on an already wet bathing suit and I want to crawl out of my skin, right? To me, that would 
it was just, you know, I, I, I'm cringing, right her, now. but, but it, yeah, it bothers me. So again, but that's a tactile thing. So it's understanding that and saying, okay, you know what? My child has a little bit of a tactile sensitivity. So let me work with this. And so, and again, I've got lots of ideas, um, you know, within that blog and in my book, but some of the best things to do are, I love to have sensory bins always out on my tables. So we just want to expose them to lots of great tactile input. So I will have, I have a bin of just dried rice sitting on my, um, on my kitchen table and they will just dig through that dried rice and I'll have little trinkets in there that they can find, but it's soothing, it's calming. Kinetic sand, I've got a bin of kinetic sand. I've got a bin of um, those Orbeez water beads. Mm -hmm. That, so, you know, we're going from dry and soft to now the wetter, more mushier textures. Mm -hmm. that you know, we're really, we're really helping them to kind of desensitize that tactile system. So again, we just, our brains have neuroplasticity. They can grow and develop. They just need opportunities to do so. So we might not get the, the shoes on them, the socks on them today, but we know let's keep, let's keep working. Um, shaving cream, finger paint. You know, I love to just put shaving cream on a cookie sheet or Cool Whip, if, you know, if you want to do that. And just let your kid use their hands all in it. Um, you know, draw pictures with it, finger paint. Again, just getting their hands slimy, sticky, yucky, all of those great things, and they will eventually carry over. Um, right. So the, the act of touching different things helps to desensitize that. So the, like you're saying so that the socks aren't such an issue, the underwear isn't such an issue. Is that what you're saying? Right. Yes. Yes. I know it seems, it seems okay. odd, but again, we're just looking at the tactile system here. Okay. Now what I would say, even though we don't want to make it stressful because the more stressful we make that, you know, if we're fighting, fighting, fighting them. Mm. It's just, they're not going to, it's not gonna be good, right? Because now we've added stress on top of a tactile situation. So but some things to do prior to getting dressed are, again, back to proprioception, is neurologically organizing and calming. So maybe before putting shoes on, maybe you do some crab walking or some wheelbarrow racing, like let's crab walk to go get your socks and shoes on or mm -hmm. um, give them those deep hugs, again, that that deep pressure prior to having to put to put the socks in shoes. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah. Putting the socks on. I also find that kids like um, tight clothing. Mm -hmm. um, I know my my daughter. Um, hopefully, she won't know that I ever said this, but she has worn basically a sports bra since she was in the first grade. Mm -hmm. um, she needed one. She likes that deep pressure. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, you know, I've, I've got several kids who like to wear maybe a tight undershirt. You know, boys will maybe wear a tight athletic shirt. Mm -hmm. Those kind of impressive types of things mm -hmm. under clothing or girls. Like, again, my daughter, um, we call it just a sports top, but, you know, a little sports bra type of thing or maybe a tight camisole type shirt. Mm -hmm. that deep pressure. Again, it, it's it's neurologically organizing and calming. And I will have to find, there is a brand, Robin, and I will, um, I'll have to find the name of it and you can put it in your show notes, but there is a brand of socks, um, I think specifically made for children who have some sensory, the oversensitivity yeah. socks. And it has, um, they're, you know, they're seamless. They don't have the toe. Yeah. Toe. That toe, that, the, the toe, toe yes. Gets them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Not good yes. for any of us, but yeah, yeah. But I do think it's one of those things, you know, my kids, um, you know, we always struggle with, they want to wear their summer clothes in the winter, and then we, I finally get them into pants and sweatshirts for the winter, and now summer comes, and now they don't want to take their pants and sweatshirts off. It is, it is hard for a lot of and for a lot of kids and but I think the more that we can give them some control over picking it out over what feels good to them mm -hmm. keeping away from a battle it, that will help as well. okay well that's really great so I've got a couple more here mm -hmm. what about aversion to smells 
That is, that is a hard one. You know, if I was going to see a kid in the clinic who had an aversion to smells, you know, what we would do is we would take little cotton balls and we'd put little, you know, we would do some cinnamon and um, vanilla, you know, just expose them to different non threatening type of scents and let them let them smell things. So again, think of desensitizing them to to smell. So again, starting the least noxious and and working your way to to things that are um, a little more a little more um, space yeah. <laughs> kind of smells. Yeah. Um, but I do feel like it is one of those things that comes back to just really building a strong sensory foundation. Yeah. You, know, um, you know, if that's interfering with their daily life, then yes, you know, expose them, let them, let them. Uh, one of my favorite things is just those, um, uh, what's the brand? Those little scented markers. I can't remember the oh, brand. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. But just, um, yeah, so we actually do that in conjunction with deep breathing. So I'm like, smell the marker and then, um, you know, so we fill the air, we, or fill our belly as we smell the markers. So let you smell things like that that are fun and they realize they're not going to be harmful to them. Um, but again, it, it's just the more we expose them to lots of different sensations in general, not just smell, we'll see those things kind of come together. What about hair brushing? Um, so one of the things with hair brushing is sensory kids with, you know, it's, it's, I, won't, I won't say sensory kids. We know every kid has their sensory things, but kids who have more, more sensory stuff love control, right? So if you're coming at me with this tool mm -hmm. um, and I have no control over it, that's scary to me. So I think the more that we can allow kids to, okay, you know, brush, brush through your own hair or, you know, you brush first and I'll brush first or find a brush that they really like, or let's do it together. You know, your hand and, and my hand. Mm. Um, I just, I feel like what we need to do is just respect that our children really don't have much control in their day. And, so true. and sensory kids, need it more, more so than, than any child. So if we can be really sensitive to that and help them work through that, um, again, maybe you brush 10 times and mommy brushes 10 times, you know, maybe make it a turn taking type of thing, but letting them feel like they're in some sort of control over it. Mm -hmm. I think, that's, I think that's really nice. Now, one of the things that I see, uh, I have seen through my kids getting older, um, and I and I also hear a lot is is chewing, right? Like chewing your shirt, um, chewing, you know, like on the corner of a pillow when you're watching TV. And uh, in fact, um, I, I had somebody ask me about this uh, and said that they bought their child specific chewing things, but they didn't want to chew those. They wanted to chew the things that they were trying to to stop them from from doing so what is the chewing what is that so okay so proprioception right for the most part um nine times out of ten is proprioception so they're chewing because those proprioceptive muscles in their jaw it's neurologically organizing and calming them so i know i laugh it, you call them shirt chewers you can see the kids in school who have the wet can, yes around their collars so they're just organizing themselves through chewing. So again, and, and it is funny you say that because there's all kinds of chew necklaces and different things and kids just, they don't want it. They just, they want to chew their fingers. They want to chew. Their yeah. Shoe. Yeah. They, so, um, but again, I think it's, um, you know, with my kids, again, if your kid's at a gum chewing age and, and you don't mind them chewing gum, you know, my daughter would be, she's like, mom, I really feel like I need to chew my fingers right now. Can I have a piece of gum? I'm like, yeah, go for it. So, or again, the water bottle, the, the straw. And I love to use straws with anything liquid, you know, applesauce, pudding, yogurt, you know, anything. And, you know, if you cut the straw in half, it's a little bit easier with, it's a yeah. thicker liquid, but just giving them lots of opportunities to get that good 
proprioceptive input, or it's like, you know what, again, let's do some crab walking, some jumping jacks. Let me give you a hug. I see you feel like you really need to chew on something right now. Let me give you a deep hug or find other ways to give them that deep pressure input. Mm. But understanding they're doing it to neurologically organize themselves. So just find, you just have to find a different, more appropriate way for them. Okay. Uh, well, that's cool. I have one, I have one more. Uh, uh -huh. and that is, this is, this is just my last one. And I think you actually answered this earlier. Um, but this, this is sunscreen, like a violent mm. no to sunscreen. Right. And I don't, mm -hmm. sunscreen is gross, right? It, it makes you feel greasy and yucky and sticky sometimes, but it's a necessary a necessary, I don't want to say evil because it's not, it's just necessary. We've got to do it, right? right? What do we do? Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a tar one. And luckily nowadays they make more of the good, like, you know, UPF, am I saying that right? UPF? Yeah. The sunscreen shirts. Oh, <laughs> sunscreen shirts. Yes, of course. Yeah. So I think now they make, you know, they, they make the clothing shirts, yeah. in that, that helps a little bit, but yeah, that is a tough one. And I will say for myself, I hate spray sunscreen. Spray sunscreen is so much stickier to me mm -hmm. than regular sunscreen. So I would say that first, like, you know, stay clear of the spray sunscreens if your child is sensitive to that, just because it, it is more sticky. But again, you know what, and I know it's, it's just a fight you're going to have to fight because they have to wear their sunscreen. But just again, understand exposing them to all kinds of different touch input working from the dry, non-noxious type of stuff, like mm -hmm. a, dry, a bin of dry rice or dry beans or something like that, and then working towards a kinetic sand, Munda, things like that, and then working towards the wet, mushy stuff, you know, yeah. shape cream, the Orbeez water beads. So okay. working in that, but never... And with the sensory bins, I don't force it. You know, maybe at first they do it with a paintbrush because they don't want to get their hands in it. Mm. So you know, I never want to push the kids into doing something that feels noxious to them. So, yeah, you know, letting them do it what feels comfortable to them. And, you know, maybe with the sunscreen, again, um, maybe letting your child do as much of it themselves as they can because it's always a little bit better if you're doing it yourself versus somebody else doing it for you. So let them lather up as much of their body as they can. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then, okay, now mommy has to help you with the rest, but That's I know it, it is a non-negotiable, but yeah. luckily they have the clothes, you know, the shirts at least, I think that mm -hmm. help with that now. Yeah. Okay. Well that, those, those are all really great suggestions. Thank you for letting me just fire those at you. Cause I didn't tell you mm -hmm. what I was going to ask you. So that's great. <laughs> I really, I really appreciate that. So I just want to say, you know, one last time that, you know, you have a website, Cindy at singer.com and you have a book called, um, why does my child do that? Right. Is that why, why is my kid doing that? Right, why is my kid doing that? Yes. yes. And so, um, we're going to put, you know, we're going to put a link to the, um, to the sensory checklist. We're going to put a link to your blog too, where you talk about, um, you know, some of the, the tips and tricks that you have to avoid the heat of the moment and, and different things like that. So, um, I just want to thank you so much. I think this is invaluable, um, to, to have a resource like you just for, for, for us to just kind of know what's going on because knowledge, like I said, at the beginning of the show, just understanding equals empathy, right? Because you don't want to mm -hmm. judge the behavior. I always say, take the behavior as secondary, like find out what's driving it first. And mm -hmm. we are a many layered human beings. And so it is, it is hard sometimes to know where to go. Um, so knowing some of this, I think is really going to help some, some parents out that are mm -hmm. listening. So I can't thank you enough, Cindy. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this edition of my podcast, Parenting Our Future. I'm parent coach Robin McMahon. And if you're enjoying this podcast, please share it with someone who you think might also need to hear this message. And don't forget to subscribe. And if you like my work, I'd be grateful if you gave me a five-star rating. For those of you who like my content and want more, visit me at yellingcurebook.com to get your copy of my book and to find other resources to help you. 
Until next time, I am wishing you and your family peace and connection.